project, you know the problems of the existing area. Uh, project purpose and need. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the main alternative concepts that we evaluated thoroughly for the interchange. We're going to announce tonight the alternative for the interchange. Uh, and then uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the next steps and then open discussion. Uh, we, we are here intentionally to get your comments and your questions and to uh, get the word out into the general public uh, about the project and, uh, and what to expect with it. So uh, we'll be here as long as we need tonight to, to have discussions with you and answer your questions. This is the third round of public meetings. Uh, round one and two have taken place over the last year and a half or so. Many of you may have uh, participated or attended those. Round one was to come out to the area to talk to the people who live here, the people who work here, people who travel in and around the interchange, and to hear what your experiences with the interchange were. We wanted to hear uh, what where you saw the congestion, where you saw the accidents, we wanted to hear your story about what you've seen driving through the interchange. Uh, the good news there is we got, a, we got quite a bit of feedback, and the even better news is that the feedback that we got from the users of the interchange closely matched the analytical data that we had regarding congestion and safety. So, so, so what we're seeing uh, from an engineering or an analytical level closely matched what you folks see as the users. The second round of public meetings uh, was to come out and show you the thorough alternative analysis we did on three concepts, which we'll show you again here tonight. Some of what we show tonight is exactly what we showed during that meeting. Uh, during that meeting, you'll see we've got about 26 criteria that we uh, used. It actually started with 100 or so, but we distilled it down to 100 different criteria that we used to evaluate across the uh, our different alternatives. We're going to show you that data again tonight. We showed it to you round two. Um, and, and, and at that point, we just wanted to hear what you had to say about those alternatives, the data that, uh, that, that we showed for all of those criteria, and hear what people had to say about what alternative you folks thought the department should select as the preferred alternative. <clears throat> and then this third round of public meetings is kind of an accumulation of all that work. We're going to show the alternative analysis again and announce the preferred alternative. The project team, it's a Mass DOT Highway Division project. Uh, the Federal Highway Administration is a close uh, technical and financial partner in the project. We've uh, encountered or incurred, or <coughs> incurred the services of a design consultant team led by HNTV that also includes Tetratech, Howard Stein Hudson, Harris Miller Miller and Hansen and Green International. You'll hear uh, a couple other folks speak to you tonight about their particular area of expertise on the project. <coughs> not going to spend a lot of time on this in general. Uh, I-90 generally runs east-west. 495 runs north-south. The southwest quadrant here, you've got a, a fairly sizable uh, residential neighborhood, the Roosevelt Farms neighborhood. Uh, the northwest CSX Transflow facility. <coughs> Northeast, uh, Cumberland Farms has a large regional distribution facility. Uh, the southeast quadrant, uh, right adjacent to the interchange, is DCR owned property, and a little bit further away is the Hopkinton Country Club. We also had the MBTA commuter rail line that runs kind of right through the middle of the interchange. The Sudbury River also comes through here, crosses under 495 and I 90. And uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more extensively as the presentation goes on. But the entire area is kind of, uh, the entire interchange is kind of set in uh, environmentally sensitive resources. It's the Cedar Swamp area of critical environmental concern, which is first AC in, e AC -AC in the state, which kind of um, dictates or controls or informs a lot of things we're able to do from a transportation point. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joe Cahill. Joe Cahill is with HNTB and he's the project manager for the design team. Like Ryan said, this is our third round of public meetings and stakeholder meetings. Um, so a lot of what I'm about to present for the next couple slides you've seen before, we've presented them in the previous meetings, but we felt it was important just to kind of go through them and recap them. Um, 
the, the current conditions, like Ryan said, you know, for those that live near the interchange, travel the interchange, you know these conditions. Um, but it's important to point out the data and our, our collection and analysis of the data shows that the interchange does not meet the current future demands, traffic demands. It's also a high crash location. Um, I see a crash out there every three to four days on average. Um, those are important drivers of this project and um, they're, they're driving our purpose and our need. Um, something else that it's not listed here, but the other thing is part of the data collection. Um, we did an extensive environmental conditions data collection as well. Um, like Ryan said, this interchange is located in the middle of a sense of environmental resources. Um, so it's something that we need to make sure we're factoring in and considering as we're developing these, these designs. So our project purpose is to improve the safety and operational efficiency at the system interchange of these two nationally and regionally significant interstate highways. That's driving, that drives our, our selected preferred alternative, that drives everything that we're designing forward. So um, at our last meeting, we showed three alternatives that were under consideration that were meeting, that were determined to meet our purpose and need. Uh, uh, correct. Yeah, I was, I was contrasting the two okay. projects. This is going to be more of a conventional construction. We are probably going to have some accelerated bridge concepts, but um, the, the idea is it's more going to be a conventional daytime construction. That's not to say there won't be periods that construction is required at night when traffic volumes are lower, but, but um, the norm will certainly be during normal daytime construction. How would you contrast the complexity of this project to the uh, big dig? <laughs> I wasn't here then. I think this is <laughs> lower, <laughs> lower, <laughs> much lower. <laughs> Not under city. I think yeah. that, I think it's an order of magnitude yeah. lower. I mean, it's it's hard, Many. but it's not it's not it's not that. Many orders of magnitude lower. <laughs> Many <laughs> orders of magnitude. So, since you were a moment ago with the uh, the Hood Street Bridge being replaced and raised, does that necess necessitate it being closed for some time, or you can continue to have a one lane passage through there? We haven't gotten to that point. Um, we will get to that point, and there will be a couple more opportunities for public meetings just like this, and we'll, we'll present that idea. Um, there's a couple different ways to do it, and DOT has a project just down the road where there, uh, the other Fruit Street in Hopkinton and Westboro that we're going to replace here in a couple of years, and I think they're still talking back and forth on that one, whether to do a full concentrated closure to, to get it done, or one side and then the other side. I'm kind of letting them have that conversation and whatever they decide, we'll see how that works and then take lessons learned from that and build it into this. But construction staging, we've started to, um, started to, maybe more than started, but we're investigating that now because we need to prove to ourselves that it can be built and how it's going to be built and all that ties into cost and schedule as well. But we haven't gotten down to that level of detail yet. And obviously in both, in both ways to do it, there's pluses and minuses or trade-offs. Yeah. Is it the rip the band-aid off alternative and you close the road, try to get in and out as fast as you can, or is it better to do one lane alternating traffic with temporary signals? And you know, So there's pluses and minuses that kind of need to be talked through over the next sure. couple of years and, and thought so through. I got a couple of questions, but I'm just going to ask the first one quickly. The Fruit Street Bridge, are we talking about a couple of feet high, or we're talking feet like 10, 15, or whatever? Because I've been there for 20 years. I have no idea how you're going to raise that bridge, number one. John McCaz, I'm the highway engineer for the project. Um, what's really ends up happening is the high point on Fruit Street is off the bridge right now. So that high point shifts onto the bridge. So the actual elevation of Fruit Street on the east side of 495 towards the country club goes up uh, about two feet, three feet. But on the high point of the bridge, it's more like five or six feet higher in that area. But you don't feel you don't feel that from the properties because it's on the bridge, not on the land. So directly adjacent to that east property line. I'm not sure where your house is, but that first house, it's going to feel like that, that at that point, it's two, two feet, two, two, three feet. Yeah, and the west side. The west side has it. Just kind of takes the hill and just. Shoots it up farther. Um, so, sorry, 
one of the other things so, you probably experience on, on Fruit Street is there's a kind of a follows the ground kind of feel in that area of the of the profile of the roadway. And this improves that so you have better sight lines as you're crossing the bridge. So you, you also talked about Fruit Street sidewalk and everything. Does that mean that you're going to widen the road at any point? Because Fruit Street, I thought it was prized possession of Hopkinton. Now you're going to destroy all the trees, or what are you going to do to that to that road? Uh, right now, it has a similar cross section to what's being proposed at uh, the crossing at uh, the MBTA CSX that's being replaced. I don't know what that. Is. So it's um, essentially it's two lanes with accommodation. Not striped bike lanes, but accommodation for bike lanes. So if you were riding a bike, you wouldn't be blocking all the cars going left and right on, on Fruit Street. Um, there's also a sidewalk on the southern side that would connect uh, from Huckleberry Road over to Saddle Hill. So, so it will be a wider area than on either side of Fruit Street. But you, you'll be taking some property from the the three or four owners uh, on that side of the bridge. Uh, the amount hasn't been completely determined yet, but there would be some minor strip takings or permanent easements of some sort or another. Do you know the scope um, is how, how far out from the bridge? I think that's basically what Yeah, on the it. west side, it's, it's pretty much right off the bridge. Uh, so on the west side, of, uh, towards the Huckleberry, uh, Huckleberry Road side, on the east side, uh, it goes to Saddle Hill Road. Oh. It's important to note, though, that we're still doing the preliminary design, so it's it's in development. So that's why when Jonathan said, you know, as far as property impacts, things like that, um, it's that gets further developed as the design progresses. So um, some of this is. It, it could change as things go, but just yeah. sorry. My second question was: uh, When will the alternatives be decided on or approved? And if they get approved, when will the project begin? We'll get to that at the end. We're going to tell you what the preferred alternative is very shortly, and then at the end of the presentation, we'll talk about schedule. I have one more question regarding the size of the bridge. The one over the railroad on Fifth Street. You could get a couple of M1, M1 tanks passing each other on that bridge. It's so wide. Is this going to be that way? It'll be 32 feet curb to curb currently. That is is that good enough for a couple of tanks? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. I'm sure. What is the weight on the tanks? You're saying you're going to offer 32. What is it currently as comparison? You know, I don't know the exact number um, off the top of my head. I, I want to say it's somewhere in the neighborhood of. 26. Oh. Yeah. So again, we're still in, we're coming out of conceptual design into environmental. And we'll get into more preliminary design, and we'll come back out in front of you. I sense people are worried that this is going to be a much higher and wider structure, and that's not what we envision at all. It'll be a little bit higher. Uh, it'll be the part that you don't see. The underneath will be wider to accommodate the wider cross section on 495, and the bridge, the Fruit Street width will be a little bit wider to make it current with uh, t today's thinking on bikes and pedestrians as well. When you say bikes and pedestrians, you're saying that the third lane almost, that is not going to continue along all of Fruit Street, correct? It just goes up to pretty well Huckleberry and the South, correct? Yeah, we haven't gotten that point yet, but that's, that's the, that's the anticipation is not to rebuild all of Fruit Street. Okay, right. Yeah, that's, that's the intended limits at this point. But we don't intend to start chasing it down so from the street. If, why would you just put it on part of the road? I mean, it doesn't make sense to have a portion of the road to have a, a bike lane and a sidewalk when you wouldn't be able to continue on in that capacity. Eventually, maybe you would. That's a narrow road where it's, there's no shoulder to be in with. Uh, understood. And that's one of the conversations we're having at the department. We. We have a goal of when we build new projects to make them more bicycle and pedestrian friendly. That's our goal. It's not appropriate in every case. I think, I think our goal on this bridge would be to have sidewalks on either side. Well, maybe the environment and the, and the neighborhood doesn't support that. 
from a number of people biking and walking down there. So we're, we, you know, we want to build it for the future, but we don't want to overbuild it for the future. So as we get further into preliminary design, then these are conversations that we'll be having. Thanks for your time. Good to have it wiped. Yeah. We've been talking before about environmental impact and, and talking about the wetlands, I guess, between all the loops. Have you all done any um, assessments or looked at um, remediation or potential issues for the, the wells of the homeowners in the area? And any potential environmental impact of, of this project? We don't know. We do have a. My corporate tech, tech, we're doing the, we, we're doing the uh, hazard material assessment, but it is limited to the right away of the highway at this time. So, are you are you suggesting that there's private drinking water wells out there that are contaminated? No, nothing's oh, okay. contaminated. Okay. That, okay. That's what we want to okay. keep. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not okay. quite sure. On Huckleberry Road, the runoff due to the salt it gets into the water, and then the drinking water of the people who live on Huckleberry. So now, if you're going to do construction there, you have to keep that in mind because there is going to be runoff into the same water supply. So I hope there's going to be some thought process about leaching and preventing such things from occurring. Yes. yes. Yeah. The, the part of what we have to do is capture and treat stormwater runoff. So. Let's continue. We have a fairly long yeah. presentation here, so let's continue. Uh, I'll just go through this really quickly. This was a category um, that basically we we're looking at make sure we weren't building anything that was going to require significantly more maintenance costs in the future than any of the other alternatives. Um, they're roughly all the same. C2 does a little bit better just from an infrastructure standpoint. And then finally, cost, the last category. Um, C2 comes in just under $300 million. 14.5 was $345 million, and 22.3 was $413 million. So based on that, based on our review of, all the, of um, all the categories you saw, and then all the feedback we received from the Wikimaps page, the stakeholder meetings, um, the public meetings, um, trade groups, industry groups, and so on, and local um, feedback, the um, MassDOT selected C2 as a preferred alternative to advance through the environmental and design process. Um, so now we're going to spend some time just going into some of those details that I mentioned earlier as far as the merges and diverges and how everything works. So, so one second, Joe. When we, when we had the round two and we showed those three concepts and we showed that alternative analysis, the green designations weren't on there. We, we just kind of threw them up there and we wanted to, to step back and not show any bias and really listen to folks. And I'm not sure how many of you folks saw those presentations, but without without exception at every one of the stakeholder or public or legislative meetings that we had. Somebody at some point during the presentation kind of raised their hand and said, so, so you're going to build C2, right? And we, we kind of went, yeah, maybe, because that's cut one cut we kind of like. And it's not, it's not always that the public and stakeholders' opinions and input so closely match the analytical and engineering data, and this is one of those cases where it does. So. The, the hard numbers and the hard analysis and engineering tell us that C2 is the right choice. And to, and to hear it during those round of stakeholder and public meetings in round two that without exception, folks want it, but C2 is the one we should build. Sorry, C2 we, was good. This is C2 right here. Is that the 55 feet? Uh, no. It is, not, it is no. not the highest one. The other, the other two were higher. Yeah, the other two, it was the, there was those flyovers that flew over 495 up at about third level that were 55 feet high. Those were the other two alternatives. And we've got some great, again, this is hard to see, I understand. We've got some great renderings and videos and animations showing showing really what it's going to, what it's, what it's going to, we are going to yes, show that tonight. Just really quickly, because I know we spent, we talked about this a lot already, but from an opportunity standpoint, C2 addresses safety in terms of low speed curves, eliminates the need for left hand entrance. Um, from an environmental standpoint, it has no Article 97 impacts. That's um, land that was set aside by the legislature. We didn't touch on that earlier, but there's some um, property that surrounds the interchange that was set aside. Um, any impacts to those properties would require an act of the legislature and a transfer. Um, we're not impacting any of those with C2. Um, 
construction challenges, it had the lowest uh, duration. Of, I mean, they were all roughly around the same time frame, but this was a little bit lower. But it had the lowest complexity of construction because we were able to build more, or we are able to build more offline. Um, and then just skipping ahead, it's, it's, it's the lowest cost uh, by a pretty significant margin. So now we're going to run through those, those renderings and videos. Uh, we're going to Anything that we put on the website has to be made um, compliant for people who are visually impaired. Sure. So what we'll need to do eventually with the videos is kind of write a script that goes with them. So there'll be a PDF that gets posted to the website, and in the middle of that PDF, it will probably have a blank slide that says, a brief film was shown here. And then if you back out to the page where you went to the PDF from, there'll be a video there, and there'll be a narration that goes with it if you want to see what that looks like. In, you know, once it's done, you can check out Mass Dot North Washington Street Bridge, where a similar thing was, uh, was, okay. was, was done with videos. Is that correct, That's Ryan? Thank you. All right, so we're going to walk through some existing conditions versus proposed condition renderings. Each, each one will have a series of, of what it looks like out there right now, and then the exact same image, but with the proposed conditions in place of what's, what, what's there today. Very, very quick question interjected. Uh, Kevin just noted, uh, reminding me that some of my trees in front of my house or next to my house on Fruit Street are marked with white X's now. Is that part of this project already? I don't believe so. Well, <laughs> I don't have any white chocolate. It wouldn't be the first or last time that something happened with yeah, that. It just, it just appeared just a few days ago. I saw them surveying it. I don't know. Probably. So I can probably tell you that those are, we worked, the town worked to deal with Eversource, and they're doing a lot of tree clearing throughout the town uh, for trees that are getting intertwined with uh, wires. It could be. Aren't they banned that's, though with plastic? That's blue. Cells? We have blue from Eversource. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's not a white spray thing. It's different than the other Vandals these days. <laughs> <laughs> I, d I don't believe that's associated with okay. this project. That's not the geotech guys or your wetland no, guys. No, that no, no, no. Bring one, one question for me. When you uh, present a project like this in the town, are you bound by their bylaws? Like there's this bylaw in Hopkinton that you can't take a tree down over a certain size uh, in the town's uh, lane next to the roadway without permission from, is it the selectman? It's the select board. I'm sorry, select board. Dad <laughs> 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 reported. So do you have to comply with that? I don't believe so. Because oh, yes, we, do. Yeah. we do? Trees, yeah. Okay. So we'll go through the process during the advertisement and design phase. Okay. Those trees will be, we'll have a hearing for that. Part. Are those, is that any tree in no, the just, town? just one set of public shade trees on the right away. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's public shade trees. And then there's a, lo this is a local, uh, I think it's the Lorax uh, statute or something. They call it. Scenic Road. Right. Well, the Conservation know. Commission here. And yeah. well, we, we discussed it also. I, I stand corrected. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So what you're looking at right now is looking north on I-495 towards I-90. I-90 is right here. Running east and west, 495. This is the old former toll plaza area. Right over here, here's that loop that we were talking about that takes you into the toll plaza from 495. And up here is Cumberland Farms. And this would be the proposed condition. So in place of that loop ramp, we have direct flyovers, forward flyovers, if you will. Um, so you don't loop around anymore. And in place of the tight ramp in this area, we have a softer curved ramp that, um, sir, I think you had a question about whether or not when you, when two ramps from the same highway come onto one direction, whether or not they would be on merging into one lane or not. You can see here that there, there's two lanes, one for eastbound to southbound, one for westbound to southbound. And those eventually become one they, lane. Yeah, yeah. In, in the white space here, they actually merge into 495 with two lanes. Mm -hmm. And then once you have the acceleration lane distance for getting up to highway speed, it merges to one lane, and that continues another 1,500 feet 
and then merges into the highway completely. But I think to your point, uh, if you can see here, I-90 eastbound, then wants to go southbound, comes down this ramp. It's got its own lane, got its own, got its own lane, and continues to have its own lane for quite a distance. It doesn't need to merge right and we right into the other track. And conversely, you've got westbound and southbound coming up over here and coming down in here, and it again continues. They each have their own lane. There's not that that conflict, safety, congestion concern until quite a bit further down the road road where they've been able to stabilize and, like Jonathan said, get up to highway speed and then they have more room and time to move in. Yeah, really throughout the interchange there's no place where uh, you don't have your own lane from point A to B until you're back up to highway speed. Where does this left lane merge? That, so there is not one in this alternative. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that doesn't show the first street bridge either. Yeah. We'll get there. No, you're, you're basically, this, this is an image from roughly above. Bridge Street Bridge yeah. in the north. Okay. Pretty much, yeah. You've done the four lanes on the northbound side. So this is a deceleration lane uh, for your northbound to eastbound uh, I-90, from 495 northbound to I-90 eastbound. So it flares uh, out yeah. just kind of off the screen. This is it? northbound 495 to right. westbound 490. Uh, and this lane right here takes you off right about there to eastbound 90. You're seeing four lanes, three yeah. through lanes, one off. <laughs> so and that, that, that lane to the right is, is on existing um, DOT 495 land, you're not, you're not yes. grabbing more from uh, neighbors there? No, we actually took the land from the median. Remember, Jonathan and Joe mentioned. So before, you can kind of see extra land up here. We shortened 495 then, squeeze it in the median. Okay. So this is looking south from I-90, uh, same um, well, opposite view. So 495 looking south, there's your former toll plaza again right over here. Cumberland Farms is off in this area. There's the Sudbury River kind of weaving its way through the interchange area. And I-90 in the foreground here. And then flipping to the proposed conditions. Uh, you can see that we've squeezed 495 as far into the median as we possibly could to allow for that much more straightforward offline construction. Um, so this is your eastbound to northbound movement. Uh, that fourth lane that you were talking about going on 495 northbound, that is for this ramp right here. Uh, That's your northbound 495 to eastbound 90 movement. And then if you're traveling southbound on 495, you have a kind of a similar movement if you were going to go eastbound or westbound. Similar to today. Similar to today. And so you would exit off and the geometry is much better. Right now it's two really tight curves with a really flat area in between, so you go really, really slow and you go fast and then you go really, really slow again. Um, that's all smoothed out and simplified so you have a nice constant speed throughout the interchange. And the big, dif the big difference there is you don't enter the utter chaos that's there today with, with the rest of the traffic movements getting into that space. You've got your own lane to make whatever movement you need to. Are you, are you planning any noise barriers along the highway for the neighbors? We are considering it. This is mm -hmm. under state, and state, state policies and regulations and federal regulations were required for a project like this, this is considered a type one project, we're required by all of those regulations and policies to consider noise abatement. Um, we are in the process of doing that now. The next big step for the project is getting through the environmental documentation. This requires a draft environmental impact report under MEPA, and that analysis will be kind of concluded with that process. The back row votes for it. <laughs> <laughs> Noted. Probably the front row. So there's the middle. <laughs> 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 Noted. How are you getting along? <clears throat> 90 west from uh, 495 south. I don't think so we're coming through the old in toll gate. In. Does that have another flyover? We have a video of that. Yeah, yeah we have uh, west to south. We do have a video actually. Okay. Uh, is, it, is that what you asked? 90 westbound to 495 south. south to 90 yeah. west. So, so we, we have a video we'll of that. Go through the old yeah. We'll have, a, we'll have a fly through of that actually. You do. So you've got to go back over. Yeah. You do. Yeah, we'll show you that. Yeah. 
much, it's much okay. simplified from okay. today. So a view right into the toll plaza here. We're looking up towards Cumberland Farms facility right over here. Roosevelt Farms is down here. And that's 495 is this way. And the other side of the X is 90. And then the proposed interchange. You can see all of the, this is a really great way to see how all of that weaving that exists out there today has been removed. Um, everything's grade separated now. And what's nice about this alternative is because everything's only one level, all of the, all of the uh, structures themselves are in that 35 foot range instead of 55 foot range. How much is Cimarano Drive? How tall is that flyover? You were asking that was about 50, 55 feet. Is it? <laughs> wow. I think. Yeah, it's a complete, I mean, that was, yeah, we just did the, let's see, if this they, is 22 feet high, then that, you'd start adding it up, but. Yeah, with, with those two, they, the, the ramps actually cross each other. So the, the, one of the ramps is higher than the other ramp when it crosses 495. Oh, all yeah. right. Right now we have uh, two views looking from entering from both sides of the interchange. So this one we're looking coming from I-90 eastbound into the interchange, the former toll plaza area. Like I-90 is down in, in, in this area, I-90 eastbound. And 495 is off in the distance over here. This is Roosevelt Farms right here. You can see it. House back then. And you'll see that the whole interchange stays within the existing toll plaza area. Um, <clears throat> and again, another example of two ramps merging together to form a two lane. This is your southbound to eastbound and your northbound, I'm sorry, southbound to westbound and your northbound to westbound merging together. But there's maintains two lanes for the rest of the way to I-90 from that point. And then this one structure that goes over all the other ramps is your westbound, I-90 westbound to 495 southbound movement. And then looking from the other direction, this is the existing condition of uh, the connector bridge that's, that goes from uh, the loop ramp on 495 northbound over to the toll plaza area. And then what the ramps would look like in this, in this configuration. Uh, you can see again, we have those forward style ramps instead of the, the slow, low speed loop ramp where that connector bridge was right here. I know we talked about this particular ramp in the first rendering. Did we talk about the smoothed out radius better for trucks and, and, and cars? Yeah, and um, did we did you mention that? Yes. I can okay. cover that a little bit here. Right. So, uh, is this a good one for you? Sure. So you can see right here the two lane ramp going northbound. Uh, southbound. Southbound. Oh, southbound, thank you. Uh, the ramp used to be right here. Um, so it had a much tighter radius, which forced the trucks to go much slower. And when you get on 495 southbound, you're going up a hill. So you have slow trucks coming onto a busy interstate highway, going up a hill. It takes them a long time to get up to speed. By having two lanes and having a much larger radius than what's out there today, those trucks can keep up their speed. And if for some reason they couldn't, they can move over into the right lane. And then they have that past the amount of time that you would normally need to accelerate for most vehicles, there is that 1,500 feet for the auxiliary lane for them to continue to accelerate without moving into the main line traffic. Just something to note with that is right now, if you can picture it, the trucks have to weave through the old toll plaza area, and then they have to brake as they're going downhill. They do the Jake brakes, they, you know, you hear that. Mm -hmm. And then they come around their curve slow, and then they have to climb back up the hill and slowly climb, and that is a major cause for not only noise, but also congestion and delay as it backs up the traffic, and then which congestion problems, safety problems, air quality so problems. So if we can keep those trucks moving, we address the braking issue, the safety issue, and the congestion issue. Okay. Good. Uh, a couple of views looking eastbound and westbound on 90 here. So we're looking west on I-90. We're right on top of 495 southbound right here. In, in the existing condition. Uh, up here is uh, the transflow facility for uh, CSX. And this is the proposed condition. Not a lot changes on 90 itself, 
uh, it maintains a similar cross section to what's out there today. Uh, what, what does change are your acceleration lanes and your deceleration lanes, especially going eastbound. Right now, there's the, the 495 bridge abutments themselves are a big constraint in getting those acceleration and, decel and deceleration lanes in. So by removing those, we can extend those. Does it look like that you know, it goes down to two lanes just before the uh, off-ramp, you know, beyond the off-ramp when you're going uh, west? I see uh, three lanes oh, sorry. going eastbound right here. That This is the westbound, I-90 westbound to I-495 uh, I southbound movement. Okay, and then going, uh, going, uh, south, uh, going east, there's four lanes and then she goes down to the at some point? Yes, three through lanes and then one on-ramp acceleration. Okay. And then just go back down. <laughs> then looking the other direction, um, this is 495 southbound and northbound, and we're looking east. There's Cumberland Farms off in the distance there. And the proposed ramp configuration at the intersection of the two highways looking east. Uh, you can see again, right, up, right over here, you have your I-495 northbound movement going to I-90 eastbound. And what's different for you, for you from what's out there today is instead of all of northbound and all of southbound coming onto I-90 at the same time. Southbound movement will come on first, they'll merge in, and then northbound movement will merge in second after the acceleration lane for uh, the southbound traffic coming onto I-90. And you, you can kind of see that here. You've got your three travel lanes, and then this is that on-ramp that we just talked about. It comes in by here, and then the other half of the traffic. Okay, we have some videos now. Give you an idea. This one's kind of an over flyover of the whole interchange. It'll give you an idea of exactly how all these ramps are braided together. So you can see the westbound, I-90 westbound to 495 southbound movement crosses over those three uh, movements coming to and from 90, and then merging in with the I-90 eastbound to 495 southbound. Here we have some fly-throughs too. Um, this is 495 northbound through the interchange. Uh, we're going to be in the, in, the, in the left lane, in the fast lane, so we're going to be moving kind of fast. Um, but I'll point out some highlights along the way. And we can watch it a couple times if, if folks would like to. Yeah, it's fine. We can watch it as many times as we want. So we're exiting off the westbound, uh, to westbound I-90 from I-495 northbound. And then we're crossing under Fruit Street right here for everyone. Now we're exiting off to eastbound I-90 from 495 northbound and crossing over I-90 here. So now you have your traffic merging in, your eastbound I-90 coming on, and then your westbound I-90 merging in right up here onto 495 northbound. It's important to note from here all the way up to Route 9, this lane, this fourth lane will continue. So right now there's only three lanes going all the way up to uh, Route 9. This right lane will continue from where westbound I-90 traffic merges in, uh, enters in all the way to the Route 9 eastbound exit. What we found in the traffic analysis was that a lot of folks that were getting on 495 from 90 <coughs> would apparently have, would have to get into the main line and wanted to get off of Route 9. So this provides them just an, a lane, extends the on-ramp into the off-ramp so they don't have to enter the main line and add that conflict to it. Show that once more? Sure. Actually, so, something else to note here is you notice 495, that median between the northbound and southbound barrels, it starts getting smaller and smaller as 495 is shifted into the median. Yeah, so all this space you see right over here, that used to be where 495 is. Where this ramp is coming in, that used to be where 495 was. This is where 495 is. Back up to uh, the Fruit Street Bridge, it looked like that off ramp goes right under the Fruit Street Bridge. It does. It does. It does. So that's a significant change. That's, that's 
the main reason mm -hmm. why the first street bridge needs to be replaced, just to allow for the cross section for the interchange. Yeah, you can't see it completely on this side, but the acceleration lanes on southbound also would have been impacted by where the abutment currently is for oh. Fruit Street. Okay. How fast was that video going? <laughs> no, I mean, how fast was the hovercraft going? You know? <laughs> I don't, I don't, I mean, don't and know and how secondly, fast off the top of my head. Secondly, do you know how fast of a speed that highway predicted when it was designed? Do you know what it was actually designed for? I don't, I'm asking. I say, I don't. Yeah, it's uh, in the 65 mile an hour range. Yeah, I wasn't around back then. <laughs> oh, I was. And so I'm wondering, what are you going to do in another 50 years? Because this really it addresses some of the problems, but not the population increase. Is that correct? It and accounts. You address the population. It accounts for a population increase. Yes. Yes, and projects out to a design year, and we base it on uh, the central transportation, to central transportation planning staff. planning staff as a statewide and regional models where they predict, predict and project population and traffic volumes in different regions throughout the mm -hmm. state. So we, they know what they're doing, and we use their numbers to project out in the future. Could you show this one more time when it goes under Fruit Street? Can you pause it? You don't have to show the whole thing. I don't know if we can. I don't know if we can. I'm going to see if I can pause it. I'm not sure if we have the capability. We're going to check Joe's trigger finger. I know, finger. I know we can't. No, that's okay. I'm just going to see. Oh, I see. Yeah. 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 So we'll start, so. No, no, not yet. No, right there. Oh, they got it. Well, little for one. You can do it. Yes, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. So you actually can see if you if you if you tilt your eyes over here, you can't see it if you're just focusing on northbound. But you can see that we have those two acceleration lanes coming in, and the existing abutment's actually right in the middle of that one lane. Well, so we need that extra space. But that's flat though. That's on the ground and then the time it merges, right? Like it's not elevated. The ramp. Which way which way are you talking about? So the, Northbound or the southbound? Ramp that's coming up to four ninety five uh, south. Yes. At that point when he gets under the bridge it's flat. Yes. On the ground. Yeah. Right. Yes. 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 Yeah. Correct. It's at the very same. Si very similar to existing grade today. On southbound, uh, where it goes underneath, it's almost like a tunnel on the right. Is that at a different elevation than it currently is at that point? How much far further to the east are you building compared to what currently exists? It, it looks like we're quite a bit further east from this, years. but rem remember exactly. That. It, it, it's it's, it's, it's not as much as you might think. It's like twenty-five feet or so. Because you've taken the median. Yeah. Yes. Because you've taken the median. Yeah. And so that, that was on the right there, is that, that retaining wall also serving as a sound barrier? I would suggest so. It might be the best type of sound barrier. Because <laughs> it's not just the mm -hmm. typical sound barriers that we build with three inch concrete core with the noise absorbing material. It's that, it's much thicker than that, and then it's soil behind it. So, yeah, it's, it's, so yeah, so it's, it's when, when you look at this ramp right here, to keep it in, in, in context, this median was once 90 feet wide. It, out there today is 90 feet wide. And it clearly is not, you know, if you count each lane is about 12 feet wide, that's not 90 feet anymore. So we're taking space from the median to make space for better mobility and safety on the roadways of the, of the ramps. Okay. Now you know how to pause. <laughs> Dangerous now. On this computer, on this night. <laughs> I-90 westbound, um, so we'll just fly through I-90 westbound here. Cumberland Farms is off here. And you can see right off there we're exiting off to 495 northbound, crossing over CSX and, and uh, merging on over there. Now right before we cross under 495, you're Great. <laughs> right, right as we go under 495, northbound and southbound, you'll see this exit lane right here is for your southbound access from, four, from I-90 westbound. Yeah. 
climbs up and over, and then all of your westbound traffic comes in on this bridge. It merges in, at this point, very similar to how it does today, except right now you don't have shoulders out there, you don't have full acceleration lanes. So two lanes are coming at this point, correct? That today, right now, there are two lanes coming and in. They will be and, there, and it will be similar, except the proper lengths and additional safety features on, on, off to the side of the road. Well, that's another location where, due to the curve, the existing curve, the trucks have to take it very slow. Yeah. Yeah. And then when they're entering westbound, they're, yeah, they're getting a hill. So, yeah, smoothing out that radius, they're maintaining their speed, and they're actually going to extend those acceleration lanes. Okay, we're going to follow a couple ramp movements, give you an idea of what it's like to travel down one of these ramps. We're going to be a little bit higher up on these, so you can kind of see the surroundings a little bit more, but we'll still follow the ramp movements. So this is I-90 westbound to 495 southbound. You're supposed to do it, not me. Okay. So again, that's the, the ramp going to northbound. We're going to move over into the deceleration lane right here. And then we'll exit off of I-90 and climb up on the ramp. So it is one lane, right? It's a single lane ramp, yes. Yeah. Go up and over and merge in with the eastbound traffic. And again, you can see you have your own lane the whole way through the interchange. You don't have to move over at any given time. We curve around at Fruit Street. We merge in with, with 495 southbound. Then you can you can see again that those two lanes continue for a distance. The right acceleration lane merges in, and you still have another 1,500 feet before you absolutely have to merge in with regular traffic. <coughs> All right, southbound I-495 southbound to I-90 westbound. This is the movement that was asked about as far yeah. as the southbound to westbound move. And before, yeah, before I start, I just want to point out this little uh, caravan of trucks right here. Uh, when you're watching this one, kind of follow along with the trucks. Um, the traffic that you see on here is representative of the percentages that you see out there today in terms of truck volumes. And in fact, on the westbound on-ramp, one out of every four vehicles that enters I-90 westbound is a truck. Half, half Over the, the course of a day. Half the freight that enters eastern Massachusetts <laughs> travels through this interchange. So it's, it's a key, <coughs> key element of our planning. And so we're exiting off right here. Uh, just right before you get to I-90. Uh, it opens up to two lanes after you cross I-90. So you can choose your direction. There's uh, not signage here now, but we'll have a full signage plan telling you which lane you need to be in for which if you want to go east and west. Yeah. Uh, spoiler alert, the left lane is to go westbound, the right lane is to go <laughs> eastbound. <laughs> uh, so eastbound exits off. We're going to continue following uh, westbound here. We're merging with the I-90, uh, the 495 northbound to I-90 westbound traffic right here. Then we have that two-lane ramp. Continuing all on, you can see there's more caravans of trucks traveling along here. And then we have two lanes on. Those trucks clearly got up to speed pretty early because they moved over pretty fast. <laughs> and then one, and another, another 1,500 feet after that. Now, how close does that get to the rest area? Just to uh, the rest time. area is about, I want to say, a mile and a half so away from the interchange. Yeah. Ways to go there. So this this does not even reach for, uh, Wood Street, the, the, the proposed project. Okay. Wood Street is a ways down still. Okay, next steps. Uh, again, to finish this round of meetings, you're the first public evening meeting we've had. We have three more next week. Uh, we appreciate you folks coming out as kind of the central town to the to the project area. Uh, the next three meetings are 
Uh, I'm not going to get the towns right. Shrewsbury. Huston, Holliston. Huston, and Holliston. We tried to go half hour or so north, south, and west, realizing that a lot of folks who use the interchange don't live here in the neighborhood. They they travel through it to get home, and we want to try and catch them at, at or near their home, too. We do you have, Brian, just so folks know, there's flyers for those meetings where you sign in. So if you have friends, neighbors, relatives, any of those people, co-workers, whatever you think might yep. benefit from it, who couldn't catch it tonight, you know, that's one of the reasons that we're, you know, trying to pepper the area. So take a flyer home, share it around, scan it in, put it on Facebook, whatever you want to do. We want people to come out. Go ahead, Ryan. Sorry. Uh, absolutely. Just wanted to make I sure just want to echo that. The project's going to be successful if, you, if, if we educate you on where we are on the project and we hear your needs and interest and input. So we have applied for any of the environmental ICEC stuff? We have not yet. We've had uh, considerable conversations with uh, DEP, Army Corps, NEPA, Federal Highway, DCR, DCR who runs the ACEC program, the local conservation commissions. Uh, this is going to be a delicate navigation to the environmental process, so we want to get those folks, similar to what we're doing here, we want to get their input and understanding early on. But the, no, no rendering of the Fruit Street um, drive-through, the impact of the bridge and all that? We had the one from underneath. Was that like coming up the hit to Fruit Street? On a, actually, on, on Fruit on, Street, yeah. we do not. No, no. Can you anticipate having that so that the... Could we do that? Yes. We could do that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Did, you did you mention that uh, the bridge that the um, railroad goes under now is impacted as well? That is a separate mass DOT project that's currently in design and will be out for construction in the next couple of years. It's it's east, it's down by the gun club, it crosses over the Sudbury River and the train so track. It's not part of this, it's project. Part of this project. It's a mass DOT project, so I'm, I'm generally familiar with it, but it's not it's not a so it's not combined in this project. One the hope is that they're gonna be in and that contract is gonna be gone before we start with this. Are you able to comment though on on, on any impact of Fruit Street with that? I, I couldn't comment with uh, any certainty of accuracy. I don't know the project really well. Uh, so if we can help Brian, we do have, and it's on the materials here, there is an I-495 interchange email address. So if you write to us, it goes to me, it goes to Ryan, it goes to members of MassDOT's legislative liaison team. We will not say to you that is not our project. If we, you know, have recourse to, you know, electric abilities to forward on, so at the very least we'll plug it to the right people if you send it to us. Was there a specific question you had on this bridge over the MBTA? What is the reference to the to the, the, the railroad line going underneath Fruit Street? Yes. Just judge, judge, wondering if there's any impact to that, that bridge at Fruit Street and the train the train tracks. Well, we're going to replace the bridge over uh, the Sunday River and over the railroad. Okay. Not so with this, but that project, as Ryan stated, uh, the south project, it's going to be advertised in construction before this project actually goes to construction. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's been coordinated with both the towns of Westboro and the town of Poppington um, because that's actually around the town line. Yeah, okay. but yeah just, I missed those meetings and communications, so thank you. Yeah, I, I know they had some public heat meetings. They may have another public meeting on that bridge, too. Yeah. Uh, I'm not quite sure where that stands yet, but um, if we do, you know, we'll do the regular notification. Do you know if that has any impact on the train itself? Um, no. Uh, usually, uh, the, the MBTA schedule uh, allows us to have a CSX trains because MBTA runs in a CSX train. So the CSX uh, trains are going to be the difficult ones to coordinate. But there's two tracks there, an inbound and outbound. Um, during construction, during different operations, they can switch the tracks. So while we're working on one portion, they can run the other track or the track. So that's being coordinated with the MBTA and CSX also. Is compliance we'd like to shut down completely? Any approach or one way or the other? Would you like to say it's shut down? So that's one of the bridge? No, the railroad. Uh, yeah, the bridge, that's one of the things that they're considering. Okay. Uh, so get into that later, just before the impacts through CSX and MBTA. Also, good. The, the commuters who you go over that every day to get yeah. work. Um, yeah, uh, it's things that they're looking at. I don't think they've uh, <coughs> determined which process they're going to use yet, but it's things that they're evaluating. 
Um, one of the things is the windows of uh, work hours that you have for the, M the impact of MBTA and CSX. Um, it's a very active line with the Worcester line coming in. Um, so commuters on the rail don't want to be impacted either. Um, but it's things that we're waiting and we're still developing that part of it. So is this is a year or two away still? Um, it's probably uh, two years away from construction. Okay. Yeah, that's, I believe that's accurate. And what's the timeline for this? We'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's two years. You folks said folks this is well done. Well, it doesn't, it it doesn't, work always, it yeah. doesn't always work this well, but again, I, I think that project is going to be done and built, and that contractor is going to be off site before our contractor shows up. Just something I want to touch on with the video. If we create a video of Food Street, this is still concept level. We haven't developed the designs enough. So it's one thing when we're looking at it from you know, 10,000 feet up, when you actually get to the details of Fruit Street, you're not going to see the details that you would typically get on a local road. You know, so That's fine. Tree it's plate, still going to be 200 feet in the air. Yeah. The, tree, the tree locations aren't going to yeah. be right. The mailboxes, the sidewalks, those details that when you live on the road, you know the road, they're not going to be there. So it's not going to quite paint an accurate picture of what it'll finally be. We could create it, but I just want to caution that that's, that's what it's going to look like. Very rough, raw, and, and blocky. Yeah, and I'll just, I'll just add to that that the side slopes that you see throughout the project area are intentionally sparse right now. We haven't delved into landscape design and wetland mitigation and all of those items in enough detail to show you what that might look like. I'd like to pause real quick and recognize Dennis from Senate uh, President Spilka's office and Representative Karen Karen Dykeman right here. Uh, they've been extremely supportive and interested in advocates for the project on your behalf. Thank you. I appreciate you being here and mm -hmm. listening to well, residents. It means a lot. Thank you. So the next big step after kind of announcing the preferred alternative is the uh, MEPA process. I mentioned it's a draft environmental impact report. Uh, for those who have trouble sleeping, uh, you'd be interested in getting a copy of it. It's about this thick. Uh, it covers um, a, a considerable um, a variety of, of uh, conceptual investigations related to the environment from this project including noise and air quality and wetlands and populations, uh, current conditions, future conditions, mitigations. And that will probably come out uh, later this fall. There will be a, a notification in the environmental monitor and there will be a, a public hearing with that as well. And we're notifying you folks so. Same time, we're progressing towards 25% design uh, through the fall and the winter. We'll have another design public hearing where we've got a uh, 25 percent level of design will be able to answer more of your more specific questions at that point. Um, so does that mean the, the design is done 25 percent? It is not. The design, we bring it, this is a design build project. So our tr traditional uh, procurement method is design bid build. So the department will take a design to 100 percent design. We'll put that on the street and ask contractors to tell us how much it would, it would cost us for them just to go build it. This is design build, so the department brings it to a 25% design. We also call it a base technical concept. We get to this point, maybe a little further, uh, we get the things that we really need out of the project, and then we put that on the street and ask a contractor and an engineer to team up as a design build entity uh, and tell us how much they were gonna charge us to finish the design and build it. Some of the advantages to design build are contractors are good at building things, engineers are good at designing things. They don't always match up, so when you've got them on the same team in the same room with the same purpose, a lot of times a contractor can say, hey look, it'd be, it'd be better for us, it'd be cheaper for, for us, it'd be uh, shorter construction, less risky construction if we could build this bridge like this. And the engineer would say, well, yeah, that's not what we pictured in the first place, but yeah, that meets all, all Mass DOT and Federal Highway Bridge standards. So you get a little bit of benefit there. Um, the other benefit is that they're able, generally able to start construction on certain elements earlier. Uh, the contractor can say, hey, I'd really like to build that northbound to eastbound ramp first. Can you design that first? The engineer will design that, 
and the contractor will start building it and the engineer will start designing other elements of the project. So the idea is it kind of gets construction started earlier and maybe more efficiently and effectively. So we are only bringing it to about a 25% design level. At 25% design, we'll have enough uh, information to apply for our environmental permits. We need uh, Section 401 water quality search, Section 404 uh, individual permit from the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, a variance from the State Wetlands Protection Act, uh, Chapter 91 for one of the bridges, and I'm probably missing a couple of others environmental permits. Those really commence in earnest at 25% design. Like I mentioned, we're already having those conversations with the agencies at this point, so there's no surprises on their end or our end to kind of make the entire process smoother. That will continue through uh, 2020 into 2021, and then we get into that design-build procurement process. Some of you have seen this schedule before. Has it really changed? Uh, some elements we're ahead on, some we might be a little bit behind on, but in general, this laser pointed us at the uh, not on the TV, sorry. Not on the TV. In, in general, we're in this area. We're, we're, we're announcing the preferred alternative. We're working hard on that EIR. We're also working on elements of the 25% design, again, through, through 2019, 2020. 2020, 2021, we get into uh, uh, applying for the environmental permits, processing them, and then design build procurement. Final project is currently slated to advertise in October of 2021. The design build procurement might take six months after that. We, uh, we go through a thorough uh, quality based selection. We want to make sure the contractor engineer team that we're selecting uh, is qualified to do a good job on, on the project. So it's a little bit longer process there. Uh, construction will probably commence in 2022. We've talked about it's about four years, so 2022 to 2026. Partially depends on where in the calendar year, the construction season, they're able to start. If they get the NTP in October, well, then it's not going to start in 2022. It'll probably start in 2023. Conversely, if they get it in May, then they have that entire 2022 construction season. So that's kind of yet to be uh, fleshed out. But in general, 2022 to 2027, that four years will be in that time frame. Nate mentioned the project email at the bottom here. We also have a project website that this presentation will be up on. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, use that email. Nate said it comes to me, a couple other folks at DOT. As soon as you send it, we get notification it's there and we're very responsive to, the, to, to provide answers to it. So, I'm at uh, 207 from the street. I'm probably the luckiest you know, person here, the closest to that. You know, right at the end of Saddleville Road, when you go 485 North, that loop ramp, you can see my house on the loop ramp right in the back. I guess they knocked on the door of the previous owner in the 50s, took some of the land by him in a domain. I don't think I'll get that land back, obviously, but um, just bought the house. The guy had trouble selling it because you just see the ramp, you see the yeah. cars, you see the lights at night. It's all going away, so I'm very, I'm very lucky. Mm -hmm. 2027. <laughs> <laughs> So with that, uh, questions, comments, again, if you're if you if you up in the middle of the night tonight and you have a question, oh, I should have asked that, please just reach out to us. Or, or feel free to come to one of the meetings next week. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks. Thanks a lot for coming out. Much appreciated.